This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you could volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 10th, 2006. Aesop's Fables, a new translation by V. S. Vernon Jones, with an introduction by G. K. Chesterton, 1912 edition. Introduction Aesop embodies an epigram not uncommon in human history. His fame is all the more deserved because he never deserved it. The firm foundations of common sense, the shrewd shots at uncommon sense that characterize all his fables, belong not to him, but to humanity. In the earliest human history whatever is authentic is universal, and whatever is universal is anonymous. In such cases there is always some central man who had first the trouble of collecting them, and afterwards the fame of creating them. He had the fame, and on the whole he earned the fame. There must be something great and human, something of the human future and the human past in such a man, even if he only used it to rob the past or deceive the future. The story of Arthur may have been really connected with the most fighting Christianity of falling Rome, or with the most heathen traditions in the hills of Wales, but the word map or Mallory will always mean King Arthur, even though we find older and better versions than the Mabignonian, or write later and worse versions than the idylls of the king. The nursery fairy tales may have come out of Asia with the Indo-European race, now fortunately extinct. They may have been invented by some fine French lady or gentleman like Perrault. They may possibly even be what they profess to be. But we shall always call the best selection of such tales Grimm's Tales, simply because it is the best collection. The historical Aesop, in so far as he was historical, would seem to have been a Phrygian slave, or at least not one to be specially and symbolically adorned with the Phrygian cap of liberty. He lived, if he did live, about the sixth century before Christ, in that time of Croesus, whose story we love and suspect like everything else in Herodotus. There are also stories of deformity of feature and a ready ribaldry of tongue, stories which, as the celebrated cardinal said, explain, though they do not excuse, his having been hurled over a high precipice at Delphi. It is for those who read the fables to judge whether he was really thrown over the cliff for being ugly and offensive, or rather for being highly moral and correct, but there is no kind of doubt that the general legend of him may justly rank him with a race too easily forgotten in our modern comparisons, the race of the great philosophic slaves. Aesop may have been a fiction like Uncle Remus. He was also, like Uncle Remus, a fact. It is a fact that slaves in the old world could be worshipped like Aesop, or loved like Uncle Remus. It is odd to note that both the great slaves told their best stories about beasts and birds. But whatever is fairly due to Aesop, the human tradition called fables is not due to him. This had gone on long before any sarcastic freedman from Phrygia had or had not been flung off a precipice. This has remained long after. It is to our advantage indeed to realize the distinction, because it makes Aesop more obviously effective than any other fabulist. Grimm's tales, glorious as they are, were collected by two German students, and if we find it hard to be certain of a German student, at least we know more about him than we know about a Phrygian slave. The truth is, of course, that Aesop's fables are not Aesop's fables, any more than Grimm's fairy tales were ever Grimm's fairy tales. But the fable and the fairy tale are things utterly distinct. There are many elements of difference, but the plainest is plain enough. There can be no good fable with human beings in it. There can be no good fairy tale without them. Aesop, or Babrius, or whatever his name was, understood that for a fable all the persons must be impersonal. 
They must be like abstractions in algebra, or like pieces in chess. The lion must always be stronger than the wolf, just as four is always double of two. The fox in a fable must move crooked, as the knight in chess must move crooked. The sheep in a fable must march on, as the pawn in chess must march on. The fable must not allow for the crooked captures of the pawn. It must not allow for what Balzac called the revolt of a sheep. The fairy tale, on the other hand, absolutely revolves on the pivot of human personality. If no hero were there to fight the dragons, we should not even know that there were dragons. If no adventurer were cast on the undiscovered island, it would remain undiscovered. If the miller's third son does not find the enchanted garden where the seven princesses stand white and frozen, why then, they will remain white and frozen and enchanted. If there is no personal prince to find the sleeping beauty, she will simply sleep. Fables repose upon quite the opposite idea, that everything is itself, and will in any case speak for itself. The wolf will always be wolfish. The fox will always be foxy. Something of the same sort may have been meant by the animal worship, in which Egyptian and Indian and many other great peoples have combined. Men do not, I think, love beetles or cats or crocodiles with a wholly personal love. They salute them as expressions of that abstract and anonymous energy in nature which to any one is awful and to an atheist may be frightful. So in all the fables that are or are not Aesop's, all the animal forces drive like inanimate forces, like great rivers or growing trees. It is the limit and the loss of all such things, that they cannot be anything but themselves. It is their tragedy that they could not lose their souls. This is the immortal justification of the fable, that we could not teach the plainest truths so simply without turning men into chessmen. We cannot talk of such simple things without using animals that do not talk at all. Suppose for a moment that you turn the wolf into a wolfish baron, or the fox into a foxy diplomatist. You will at once remember that even barons are human. You will be unable to forget that even diplomatists are men. You will always be looking for that accidental good humor that should go with the brutality of any brutal man, for that allowance of all delicate things, including virtue, that should exist in any good diplomatist. Once put a thing on two legs instead of four, and pluck it of feathers, and you cannot help asking for a human being, either heroic, as in the fairy tales, or unheroic, as in the modern novels. But by using animals in this austere and arbitrary style, as they are used on the shields of heraldry, or in the hieroglyphics of the ancients, men have really succeeded in handing down those tremendous truths that are called truisms. If the chivalric lion be red and rampant, it is rigidly red and rampant. If the sacred ibis stands anywhere on one leg, it stands on one leg for ever. In this language, like a large animal alphabet, are written some of the first philosophic certainties of men. As the child learns A for ass, or B for bull, or C for cow, so man hath learnt here to connect the simpler and stronger creatures with the simpler and stronger truths. That a flowing stream cannot befoul its own fountain, and that any one who says it does is a tyrant and a liar. That a mouse is too weak to fight a lion, but too strong for the cords that can hold a lion. That a fox who gets the most out of a flat dish may easily get least out of a deep dish. That the crow whom the gods forbid to sing, the gods nevertheless provide with cheese. That when the goat insults from a mountain top, it is not the goat that insults, but the mountain. And all these are deep truths, deeply graven on the rocks wherever men have passed. It matters nothing how old they are, or how new. They are the alphabet of humanity, which, like so many forms of primitive picture-writing, employs any living symbol in preference to man. 
These ancient and universal tales are all of animals, as the latest discoveries in the oldest prehistoric caverns are all of animals. Man, in his simpler states, always felt that he himself was something too mysterious to be drawn. But the legend he carved under these cruder symbols was everywhere the same, and whether fables began with Aesop or began with Adam, whether they are German and medieval as Reynard the Fox, or as French and Renaissance as La Fontaine, the upshot is everywhere essentially the same, that superiority is always insolent, because it is always accidental, that pride goes before a fall, and that there is such a thing as being too clever by half. You will not find any other legend but this written upon the rocks by any hand of man. There is every type and time of fable, but there is only one moral to the fable, because there is only one moral to everything. Introduction by G. K. Chesterton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesop's Fables The Fox and the Grapes A hungry fox saw some fine bunches of grapes hanging from a vine that was trained along a high trellis, and did his best to reach them by jumping as high as he could into the air. But it was all in vain, for they were just out of reach. So he gave up trying, and walked away with an air of dignity and unconcern, remarking, I thought those grapes were ripe, but I see now they are quite sour. End of Fox and the Grapes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesop's Fables, The Goose That Laid the Golden Eggs A man and his wife had the good fortune to possess a goose which laid a golden egg every day. Lucky though they were, they soon began to think that they were not getting rich fast enough, and, imagining the bird must be made of gold inside, they decided to kill it in order to secure the whole store of precious metal at once. But when they cut it open, they found it was just like any other goose. Thus they neither got rich all at once, as they had hoped, nor enjoyed any longer the daily addition to their wealth. Much wants more, and loses all. End of The Goose That Laid the Golden Eggs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com Aesop's Fables The Cat and the Mice There was once a house that was overrun with mice. A cat heard of this, and said to herself, That's the place for me and off she went and took up her quarters in the house, and caught the mice one by one and ate them. At last the mice could stand it no longer, and they determined to take to their holes and stay there. "'That's awkward,' said the cat to herself. "'The only thing to do is to coax them out by a trick.' So she considered a while, and then climbed up the wall and let herself hang down by her hind legs from a peg, and pretended to be dead. By and by a mouse peeped out and saw the cat hanging there. Aha! it cried. You are very clever, madam, no doubt, but you may turn yourself into a bag of meal hanging there, if you like, yet you won't catch us coming anywhere near you. If you are wise, you won't be deceived by the innocent airs of those whom you have once found to be dangerous. End of The Cat and the Mice This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com. Aesop's Fables The Mischievous Dog. There was once a dog who used to snap at people and bite them without any provocation, and who was a great nuisance to everyone who came to his master's house. So his master fastened a bell round his neck to warn people of his presence. The dog was very proud of the bell, and strutted about tinkling it with immense satisfaction. But an old dog came up to him and said, "'Fewer airs you give yourself the better, my friend.' "'You don't think, do you, that your bell was given you as a reward of merit? "'On the contrary, it is a badge of disgrace. "'Notoriety is often mistaken for fame. "'End of The Mischievous Dog "'This is a LibriVox recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Wordaps. Aesop Fables The Charcoal Burner and the Fuller There was once a charcoal burner who lived and worked by himself. A Fuller, however, happened to come and settle in the same neighborhood. And the charcoal burner, having made his acquaintance, and finding he was an agreeable sort of fellow, asked him if he would come and share his house. We shall get to know one another better that way, he said, and beside, our household expenses will be diminished. The fuller thanked him, but replied, I couldn't think of it, sir. Why, everything I take such pains to whiten would be blackened in no time by your charcoal. End of the charcoal burner and the fuller. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, on January twelfth, two thousand six. Aesop's Fables. THE MICE IN COUNCIL Once upon a time all the mice met together in council, and discussed the best means of securing themselves against the attacks of the cat. After several suggestions had been debated, a mouse of some standing and experience got up and said, "'I think I have hit upon a plan which will ensure our safety in the future, provided you approve and carry it out.' It is that we should fasten a bell round the neck of our enemy, the cat, which will, by its tinkling, warn us of her approach. This proposal was warmly applauded, and it had been already decided to adopt it, when an old mouse got upon his feet and said, I agree with you all that the plan before us is an admirable one, but may I ask, who is going to bell the cat? End of The Mice in Council This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Beth Dudek Aesop's Fables THE BAT AND THE WEASELS A bat fell to the ground and was caught by a weasel, and was just going to be killed and eaten when it begged to be let go. The weasel said he couldn't do that because he was an enemy of all birds on principle. "'Oh, but,' said the bat, "'I'm not a bird at all. I'm a mouse.' "'So you are.' said the weasel. Now I come to look at you. And he let it go. Some time after this, the bat was caught in just the same way by another weasel, and, as before, begged for its life. No, said the weasel, 
I never let a mouse go by any chance. But I'm not a mouse, said the bat. I'm a bird. Why, so you are, said the weasel, and he too let the bat go. Look and see which way the wind blows before you commit yourself. End of The Bat and the Weasels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Beth Dudek Aesop's Fables The Dog and the Sow A dog and a sow were arguing, and each claimed that its own young ones were finer than those of any other animal. Well, said the sow at last, mine can see at any rate when they come into the world, but yours are born blind. End of The Dog and the Sow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Aesop's Fables The Fox and the Crow A crow was sitting on a branch of a tree with a piece of cheese in her beak, when a fox observed her and set his wits to work to discover some way of getting the cheese. Coming and standing under the tree, he looked up and said, "'What a noble bird I see above me! "'Her beauty is without equal, the hue of her plumage exquisite. "'If only her voice is as sweet as her looks are fair, "'she ought without doubt to be queen of the birds.' "'The crow was hugely flattered by this, "'and just to show the fox that she could sing, "'she gave a loud caw. "'Down came the cheese, of course, and the fox— "'Snatching it up, said, "'You have a voice, madam, I see. "'What you want is wits.'" End of The Fox and the Crow Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 11, 2006 In Oceanside, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com Aesop's Fables The Horse and the Groom there was once a groom who used to spend long hours clipping and combing the horse of which he had charge, but who daily stole a portion of his allowance of oats, and sold it for his own profit. The horse gradually got into worse and worse condition, and at last cried to the groom, "'If you really want me to look sleek and well, you must comb me less and feed me more.'" End of The Horse and the Groom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com Aesop's Fables The Wolf and the Lamb A wolf came upon a lamb straying from the flock, and felt some compunction about taking the life of so helpless a creature, without some plausible excuse. So he cast about for a grievance, and said at last, "'Last year, sirrah, you grossly insulted me.' "'That is impossible, sir,' bleated the lamb, "'for I wasn't born then.' "'Well,' retorted the wolf, "'you feed in my pastures.' "'That cannot be,' replied the lamb." "'for I have never yet tasted grass.' "'You drink from my spring, then,' continued the wolf. 
"'Indeed, sir,' said the poor lamb, "'I have never yet drunk anything but my mother's milk.' "'Well, anyhow,' said the wolf, "'I'm not going without my dinner,' and he sprang upon the lamb and devoured it without more ado. End of The Wolf and the Lamb This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Beth Dudek. Aesop's Fables The Peacock and the Crane. A peacock taunted a crane with the dullness of her plumage. Look at my brilliant colors said she, and see how much finer they are than your poor feathers. I am not denying, replied the crane, that yours are far gayer than mine, but when it comes to flying I can soar into the clouds, whereas you are confined to the earth like any dunghill cock. End of the Peacock and the Crane this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Beth Dudek. Aesop's Fables The Cat and the Birds A cat heard that the birds in an aviary were ailing, so he got himself up as a doctor and taking with him a set of the instruments proper to his profession, presented himself at the door, and inquired after the health of the birds. "'We shall do very well,' they replied, without letting him in, "'when we've seen the last of you.' A villain may disguise himself, but he will not deceive the wise. End of The Cat and the Birds this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com. Aesop's Fables The Spendthrift and the Swallow. A spendthrift who had wasted his fortune and had nothing left but the clothes in which he stood, saw a swallow one fine day in early spring. Thinking that summer had come and that he could now do without his coat, he went and sold it for what it would fetch. A change, however, took place in the weather, and there came a sharp frost which killed the unfortunate swallow. When the spendthrift saw its dead body, he cried, "'Miserable bird! Thanks to you I am perishing of cold myself!' One swallow does not make summer. End of The Spendthrift and the Swallow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com. Aesop's Fables The Old Woman and the Doctor. An old woman became almost totally blind from a disease of the eyes, and after consulting a doctor, made an agreement with him in the presence of witnesses that she should pay him a high fee if he cured her, while if he failed he was to receive nothing. The doctor accordingly prescribed a course of treatment, and every time he paid her a visit he took away with him some article out of the house, until at last, when he visited her for the last time, and the cure was complete, there was nothing left. When the old woman saw that the house was empty, she refused to pay him his fee, and after repeated refusals on her part, he sued her before the magistrates for payment of her debt. On being brought into court, she was ready with her defense. 
"'The claimant,' said she, "'has stated the facts about our agreement correctly. "'I undertook to pay him a fee if he cured me, "'and he, on his part, promised to charge nothing if he failed. "'Now he says I am cured, "'but I say that I am blinder than ever, "'and I can prove what I say. "'When my eyes were bad I could at any rate "'see well enough to be aware that my house contained "'a certain amount of furniture and other things.' But now, when according to him I am cured, I am entirely unable to see anything there at all. End of the Old Woman and the Doctor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Warraps Aesop's Fables The Moon and Her Mother The moon once begged her mother to make her a gown. How can I? replied she. There's no fit in your figure. At one time you're a new moon, and at another you're a full moon, and between whiles you're neither one nor the other. End of the Moon and Her Mother This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, on January 12, 2006. Aesop's Fables Mercury and the Woodman A woodman was felling a tree on the bank of a river, when his axe, glancing off the trunk, flew out of his hands and fell into the water. As he stood by the water's edge, lamenting his loss, Mercury appeared and asked him the reason for his grief, and on learning what had happened, out of pity for his distress, he dived into the river and— bringing up a golden axe, asked him if that was the one he had lost. The woodman replied that it was not, and Mercury then dived a second time, and, bringing up a silver axe, asked if that was his. No, that is not mine either, said the woodman. Once more Mercury dived into the river, and brought up the missing axe. The woodman was overjoyed at recovering his property, and thanked his benefactor warmly, and the latter was so pleased with his honesty that he made him a present of the other two axes. When the woodman told the story to his companions, one of these was filled with envy of his good fortune, and determined to try his luck for himself. So he went and began to fell a tree at the edge of the river, and presently contrived to let his axe drop into the water. Mercury appeared as before, and, on learning that his axe had fallen in, he dived and brought up a golden axe, as he had done on the previous occasion. Without waiting to be asked whether it was his or not, the fellow cried, "'That's mine! That's mine!' and stretched out his hand eagerly for the prize. But Mercury was so disgusted at his dishonesty that he not only declined to give him the golden axe— but also refused to recover for him the one he had let fall into the stream. Honesty is the best policy. End of Mercury and the Woodman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, on January 13th, 2006. Aesop's Fables The Ass, the Fox, and the Lion An ass and a fox went into partnership and sallied out to forage for food together. They hadn't gone far before they saw a lion coming their way, 
at which they were both dreadfully frightened. But the fox thought he saw a way of saving his own skin, and went boldly up to the lion, and whispered in his ear, "'I'll manage that you shall get hold of the ass, without the trouble of stalking him, if you'll promise to let me go free.' The lion agreed to this, and the fox then rejoined his companion, and contrived before long to lead him by a hidden pit, which some hunter had dug as a trap for wild animals, and into which he fell. When the lion saw that the ass was safely caught and couldn't get away, it was to the fox that he first turned his attention, and he soon finished him off, and then, at his leisure, proceeded to feast upon the ass. Betray a friend, and you'll often find you have ruined yourself. End of The Ass, the Fox, and the Lion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Robert Garrison. For more information on this reader, please visit Climber53.com. Aesop's Fables The Lion and the Mouse A lion, asleep in his lair, was waked up by a mouse running over his face. Losing his temper, he seized it with his paw and was about to kill it. The mouse, terrified, piteously entreated him to spare its life. "'Please let me go,' it cried, "'and one day I will repay you for your kindness.' The idea of so insignificant a creature ever being able to do anything for him amused the lion so much that he laughed aloud and good-humouredly let it go. But the mouse's chance came, after all. One day the lion got entangled in a net which had been spread for game by some hunters, and the mouse heard and recognized his roars of anger and ran to the spot. Without more ado it set to work to gnaw the ropes with its teeth, and succeeded before long in setting the lion free. "'There!' said the mouse. "'You laughed at me when I promised I would repay you, but now you see, even a mouse can help a lion.' End of The Lion and the Mouse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Aesop's Fables The Crow and the Pitcher A thirsty crow found a pitcher with some water in it, but so little was there that, try as she might, she could not reach it with her beak, and it seemed as though she would die of thirst within sight of the remedy. At last she hit upon a clever plan. She began dropping pebbles into the pitcher, and with each pebble the water rose a little higher, until at last it reached the brim, and the knowing bird was enabled to quench her thirst. Necessity is the mother of invention. End of The Crow and the Pitcher Read by Kara Schallenberg on January thirteenth, two 2006 In Oceanside, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman, in St. Louis, Missouri, on January thirteenth, two 2006. Aesop's Fables The Boys and the Frogs some mischievous boys were playing on the edge of a pond, and, catching sight of some frogs swimming about in the shallow water, 
they began to amuse themselves by pelting them with stones, and they killed several of them. At last one of the frogs put his head out of the water, and said, Oh, stop, stop! I beg of you, what is sport to you is death to us. End of The Boys and the Frogs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesop's Fables The North Wind and the Sun A dispute arose between the North Wind and the Sun, each claiming that he was stronger than the other. At last they agreed to try their powers upon a traveller, to see which could soonest strip him of his cloak. The North Wind had the first try, and gathering up all his force for the attack, he came whirling furiously down upon the man, and caught up his cloak as though he would wrest it from him by one single effort. But the harder he blew, the more closely the man wrapped it round himself. Then came the turn of the sun. At first he beamed gently upon the traveller, who soon unclasped his cloak, and walked on with it hanging loosely about his shoulders. Then he shone forth in his full strength, and the man, before he had gone many steps, was glad to throw his cloak right off, and complete his journey more lightly clad. Persuasion is better than force. End of the North Wind and the Sun This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesop's Fables The Mistress and Her Servants A widow, thrifty and industrious, had two servants whom she kept pretty hard at work. They were not allowed to lie long abed in the mornings, but the old lady had them up and doing as soon as the cock crew. They disliked intensely having to get up at such an hour, especially in the winter time. And they thought that if it were not for the cock waking up their mistress so horribly early, they could sleep longer. So they caught it and wrung its neck, but they weren't prepared for the consequences. For what happened was that their mistress, not hearing the cock crow as usual, waked them up earlier than ever and set them to work in the middle of the night. End of The Mistress and Her Servants This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesop's Fables The Goods and the Ills There was a time in the youth of the world when goods and ills entered equally into the concerns of men, so that the goods did not prevail to make them altogether blessed, nor the ills to make them wholly miserable. But owing to the foolishness of mankind, the ills multiplied greatly in number, and increased in strength, until it seemed as though they would deprive the goods of all share in human affairs, and banish them from the earth. The latter, therefore, betook themselves to heaven, and complained to Jupiter of the treatment they had received, at the same time praying to him to grant them protection from the ills, and to advise them concerning the manner of their intercourse with men. Jupiter granted their request for protection, and decreed that for the future they should not go among men openly in a body, and so be liable to attack from the hostile ills, but singly and unobserved, and at infrequent and unexpected intervals. Hence it is that the earth is full of ills, for they come and go as they please, and are never far away, while goods, alas, come one by one only, and have to travel all the way from heaven, so that they are very seldom seen. End of The Goods and the Ills This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesop's Fables The Hares 
and the frogs. The hares once gathered together and lamented the unhappiness of their lot, exposed as they were to dangers on all sides and lacking the strength and the courage to hold their own. Men, dogs, birds, and beasts of prey were all their enemies and killed and devoured them daily. And sooner than endure such persecution any longer, they one and all determined to end their miserable lives. Thus resolved and desperate, they rushed in a body towards a neighbouring pool, intending to drown themselves. On the bank were sitting a number of frogs, who, when they heard the noise of the hares as they ran, with one accord leaped into the water and hid themselves in the depths. Then one of the older hares, who was wiser than the rest, cried out to his companions, "'Stop, my friends! Take heart! Don't let us destroy ourselves after all. See, here are creatures who are afraid of us, and who must, therefore, be still more timid than ourselves. End of the Hares and the Frogs